Discovering grace, one man at a time. Impact, men passionate about Christ. Hey, good morning, everybody. It's Trey. And uh, just thanks so much uh, for tuning in and downloading our brand new podcast. The past few weeks have just been really cool to see people from all over the world that are that are tuning in to listen to our message of discovering grace one man at a time. It's just been it's just been just surreal how God has uh, winked at us every day and told us just to keep pushing, to keep on. More and more need to hear the messages, and more and more men are are are, are understanding in a deeper way who they are as Christian men. So this is uh, it's awesome to be bringing to you another Grace for Man podcast. Of course, it's a it's an extension of Men Passionate About Christ Ministries, and uh, we are just so tickled that you are here uh, on your way to work or mowing your yard or, or whatever you're doing today that you're tuning in. Um, last week's uh, podcast was a special one for me as we, we took some excerpts from our Grace for the Imperfect Man conference and um, dove deep into a very sensitive issue. So if you haven't heard it yet, uh, you get to listen uh, and and hear us talk uh, with uh, my friend Nate Larkin as uh, we went through what's deep in a man's heart as it uh, as it pertains to lust and pornography and uh, how we can get through together. So um, please tune into that one. It's on all the major podcast uh, outlets, and uh, would love for you to just to catch up and uh, listen to every one we've had the past four weeks. You know. Getting ready for this one today, I I was I was inspired uh, by an event that happened to me about two months ago, and I wanted uh, really to share this uh, from the heart because I know it's something all of us men struggle with. Um, I made a new friend, and his name is Jonathan. And uh, Jonathan recently asked me to go with him to visit. The cemetery where his deceased mother and father were laid to rest. Um, it was a strange request. When he asked me, I was uh, a little confused as to why, but um, I want to tell you a little bit about Jonathan and uh, how special this guy is. Um, it was about a year ago that I met Jonathan at our local rescue mission the Christ is the answer rescue mission. And uh, we were putting on a, a weekly mentorship, Bible study, accountability uh, type meeting where 10 to 12 of the men uh, came in. And in any case, Jonathan showed up one Tuesday, relatively new resident, and he came in and sat in with us. And I could tell there was something about Jonathan when he sat in the room. Number one, I could look at him and see that he was very uncomfortable. And uh, as we uh, started talking about the grace of God and how how amazing his love is and grace is the most powerful tool of God that we have uh, to help us overcome sin, lustful thoughts, um, you name it. And, um, you know, after the first night I sat with him and was looking at him, and I could tell he just had a, a little bit of a concerned look in his eye. And then uh, after we chatted, after after the meeting, he and I chatted, and then I've come to realize that Jonathan was brought up in a Jewish home. Now, I wouldn't say they practice Judaism, but he is uh, of Jewish heritage and um, had never really heard this message about grace before or you know, the love of Christ. So, um, he came back the next week and I saw in his eyes, he looked a little more at peace as we, we talked about men's issues and God's grace over us and his unconditional love for us. And as we talked about identity and our identity as Christians and how our sins don't define us, Jesus does. And I could see in his eyes, you know, just some wonderment as uh, he continued to soak in. He never said anything. He just continued to soak in um, the seeds we were planting, and we were presenting to him a a part 
uh, and a, a religious aspect. I hate using that word. All you guys know that I hate using that word, but it was something he'd never been exposed to. Everything about religion was thou shalt nots and you can't do's and you get punished if and things like that. And he was hearing this new language coming from us as Christian men and believers. And um, I could tell he was very interested. And another week goes by and, and all of a sudden he perks up and starts asking a couple of questions about you know what forgives sins and, and, and how it was Jesus's blood that forgave our sins. There was nothing we could do to um, have be forgiven by God other than believing in the blood of Christ. And after about five or six weeks, um, I got a note from a couple of the administrators and the, uh, the, um, the manager of the mission uh, saying that my friend Jonathan had just been baptized, hallelujah, and had just taken Christ uh, as his personal Lord and Savior, and I, I was just ecstatic. And uh, the next Tuesday, when we showed up for group, we uh, we celebrated that. And he was very happy. And you can tell, at the same time, being very happy, he had a lot of questions. <laughs> so you know, we dove into those for a while over the next few weeks, and I could I could see him starting to grow. And. But I could also tell, looking into his eyes, there was something behind his eyes that was troubling him. And I couldn't put my finger on it, but every time we started talking about the love of Christ, our unconditional forgiveness that allows us to forgive others, I could see he wasn't at peace. My friend Jonathan wasn't at peace at all. And one night after our session... He pulled me aside and he says, Trey, I, I was baptized. I, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. Uh, I believe in his resurrection and, and, and I'm starting to understand the Holy Spirit that has indwelled me. And But when you talk about forgiveness, I have a lot of reservations. And I said, well, that's okay, buddy. I mean, you know, you know, once you're saved, you're a brand new Christian. Your mind goes through the renewal process like Paul talks about. And you, you, you learn, you grow, you grow in the knowledge of who you are. And, and you know, forgiveness is a, is a tough thing for people in the flesh. But I, you know, you want to tell me a little bit about it? And he says, no, I'm, I'm not, not ready to talk about it. But I just am having a lot of trouble getting my mind around it. So I want to pray about it. I want to think about it more. And I said, hey, that's fine, brother. You know, we'll, uh, we'll just take it for another day. So the next week comes around. And we're sitting there. And once again, forgiveness comes up. And I could see Jonathan just just kind of squirming in his chair. And I could tell he was really disturbed. So afterwards, we were there. And he says, Trey, I just don't know this forgiveness thing. It, man, Trey, I, I just... I just don't think I could ever forgive somebody for something they did to me. And I put my arm around him. I said, let's, let's take a little walk, bro. And we walked away from everyone where we were just private. And he, he kind of looked at me with a tear in his eye and says, I, I know Jesus died and forgave me all, all my sin. And I know I'm going to be with he- in him with heaven one day, but I just can't shake some things. I've been haunted for years on. And I said, well, talk to me, man. Who do we need to forgive? And he said, I need to forgive my father. And I need to forgive my brother. I said, okay. Well, that's a starting point. You said who you needed to forgive or, you know, that that that, that you could forgive. Tell me what's going on. And he says, you know, Trey, I, it's so hard to talk about, but um, my father, my father sexually abused me as a child all the way up until I was about 14 years old. And I've never told anyone that in my whole life. 
I'm haunted by these memories. They keep me up at night. They go through my mind over and over and over of what my dad did to me and what he made me do to him. And then my brother did the same thing. So I, I, I just can't, I don't think there's any way I can forgive them for that. I was just a kid. I had no clue what was happening. I thought, I thought every home on our street, all the boys were, that was just part of what life was supposed to be. And it made me so uncomfortable and it made me so sad and so scared. And I hated it when my dad came home, especially at at the end of a bad day or, or if my mom was out while my dad came home, I dreaded it. put my arms around him and I just told him I loved him. I, I, I was floored. My mouth was, you know, dropped to the ground as he, as he started telling me stories of the abuse that he went through from his own father, his own brother, his own flesh and blood. And he got it off his chest And we prayed together at that moment for peace. We prayed together for that moment to to help with those memories. We prayed at that moment just to give him peace and the strength that only God's Holy Spirit can give him as he's trying to sort through his mind and his heart on his his, his new identity as a Christian man and also trying to let go of his past. You know, Satan works in crazy ways, guys. I mean, Satan worked on my friend Jonathan in the way that, you know, Jonathan actually convinced himself that it was his fault. He actually harbored that, you know. You could have said no. You could have done this. You could have done that. And John looks at me and says, what eight-year-old knows to say no or go say something to someone for fear that your dad will punish you? It, it was a sobering night, as as he told me. But at the same time, as he opened his mouth for the first time in 40-some-odd years about these experiences, you could see a little, a little weight lifted off his shoulders. And he swore me to secrecy. He didn't want me to mention it to anybody at the rescue mission. And, and John wasn't in the rescue mission for anything like drugs or being in prison or anything like that. He just made some bad business decisions. He's a very smart, college-educated man, very articulate businessman, marketing-type mindset. And he was just there to reset his life. Well, he reset it the day that he believed in Christ, and he didn't realize the magnitude of it. So we fast forward to the next week for the Tuesday night get together. And once again, we we're getting in and diving deep into who we are as Christian men. And, and I'm trying to work with these, these men that are a lot, all of them, all of them are in fragile states, trying to get back into society, trying to overcome thoughts and temptations and addictions and pornography and all those things that had led to them making horrible decisions that they're paying the consequences for now. John spoke up a little bit that night. And he just spoke up a little bit on salvation. And I sat there and I stared at him, just wondering if he was going to talk about the thorn in his side. And that night he didn't. And then the next week we, we kicked off our session with just a round table. And I just said, what thorns in your side, guys? What do we need to pray for you for this week? Man after man stood up and mentioned a couple of things they need to pray for, whether it's family or they think they're falling off the wagon, they're not going to make it through the program, whatnot. And then John stood up and said, guys, I there's something I need to share with you. I've never shared this with anyone in my life but Trey. But I've been praying and I just feel the Holy Spirit is convicting me 
as part of my process of healing and growing in Christ, I want to tell you a little bit about my story. Then John stood there in front of 15 people and just opened his heart and purged and told everyone I was been sexually abused by my father and my brother for years and years. He told them how that experience totally warped his mind on sexuality and God's plan for sexuality. It totally warped his whole thought process of sex just being a physical act and not a gift from God. It totally set him up for some things later in life that he still struggled with. And as John started getting a tear in his eye and telling his story, you could feel nothing but unconditional love coming from every other man in the room. All 13 to 14 of us laid our hands on John that night and prayed. We pray for the Holy Spirit just to work inside of him that John gets to know who he is as a Christian man even more. And that eventually John's going to let go of those thoughts and those memories. John was so relieved when he talked about that that night. He started texting me and talking to me and I just don't under, he says I just can't I can't thank you enough. I can't thank you know for letting me speak and I just feel like these weights are being lifted off my shoulders. I know it wasn't my fault. I know it screwed me up. I mean, John went on to have a career. He is actually behind the scenes in the porn business. Think about that. It set his mind up and his heart up for some, for the Satan just to walk and play in his head and his heart for years and years and years. We had several more meetings together, and after about, I guess John had been at the rescue mission for about six months, he sent me a text and asked me if I wanted to have a cup of coffee with him. That's my favorite thing to do, is sit across the table from another brother, like we all do with men passionate about Christ, and just the rubber meets the road, eye to eye, let's let's get through this together, through brotherhood in the spirit of Christ. And we sat there at coffee that day and he asked me if I wouldn't mind joining him at the cemetery the next day. I said, sure. I'll drive there with you. I called my brother Michael, who um, is one of our impact brothers here locally in Brevard County, Florida, and I felt like I was going to need some backup. You know, we're three or more gathered together, you know the saying. And so we pulled into the cemetery. And the three of us walked to his mother and father's uh, mausoleum. You know, their names there. And they both had the Star of David on them because of the, their Jewish heritage. And it was... It was a big moment as my brother Jonathan began speaking. Humorous moment to start as he began speaking. He said, Mom, hey, it's Jonathan. I uh, I need to tell you um, a couple of things that are about to happen right now. And my brothers are here with me. Uh, but the first thing is, Mom, I needed to tell you that... Um, I'm still Jewish by heritage, but I'm born again. I'm a Christian, and I believe I love Jesus Christ, and He died for my sins. <laughs> and we all, we all got a chuckle out of that. And He said, "Mom, I love you." And some of these things I'm about to tell you now are probably going to come as a shock to you. And I know He's He's talking to a 
a stone. And then he proceeded to turn the conversation to his dad. And he said, Dad, I don't know why you did all those things to me. I was just a kid. He said, Dad, what you made me do to you and what you did to me, I, I, I just, it, it sickens my stomach that a father would do that to a son. He said, Dad, I, I've been carrying this around and having nightmares about this for 40 years. It messed up my life as far as sexuality and who I am, and I'm, I'm, over, I'm overcoming that now. My profession that I chose, I'm, I'm getting back in gear as I'm knowing who Christ is and how he's working in me. And, and Dad, I, I, know you'd, I know you must have done it to my brother because my brother did it to me. And, and, and Dad, I know you also must have done it to my sister as well because, you know, my sister seems very confused as she's continued to experiment in homosexuality. And I don't know why you did it, Dad, but I know it's not my fault. And I don't want to be a prisoner any longer I don't want to hold on to this anymore. And I, I realized once I became a Christian and that the Holy Spirit of God who has indwelled me and fills me now, it's only through Him I can let it go. And the cornerstone of being a Christian is forgiveness. So, Dad... Today, as Jesus forgave me of all of my sins through his blood on that cross, I forgive you of sexually molesting me all of my childhood years. I forgive you so I can let it go. There was a long moment of silence there as my brother Michael and I held him and we had our arms around him and prayed with him as he wept. The one thing he said he could never forgive for, forgive someone for, he did. Nope. My, he always told me after some of those meetings, I'd look at him and say, you ready? And he goes, nope. <laughs> Good try, bro. Not today. He actually said that one night. But on this day, this spring, it's just this past spring, I sat there at a cemetery in Rockledge, Florida. As my brother Jonathan stood there with myself and my impact brother Michael, And Jonathan forgave his father for what many people listening right now would say is unforgivable. Just like Jesus forgave us for the unforgivable. Jonathan's doing great today. He continues his walk. I meet with him once a week, have a cup of coffee. I can't wait to sit down with him and just see his growth. He's actually writing blogs now to help other people that have been sexually molested, many by their own family or personal friends. He's joined a group or two to help tell his story. His story is on our impact page and our website, and you can read it in more detail. He's just been such a blessing. I have learned so much. I have forgiven so many people since that day that I just kind of kept it inside. Yeah, I'm going to hold a grudge against that guy because he did me wrong. You ever felt that way, brother? (laughs) Let's get real for a minute. Can you forgive the unforgivable? 
Has someone done something to you or done something to your family? Done something to you at work that kept you from getting the next promotion? Are you harboring that? Have you forgiven them? You know, forgiveness is tough. It's tough for men in the flesh. It's really hard. A few points to think about when you're thinking about forgiveness. First off is, who is it that wronged you? Yeah, they made you mad. They pissed you off. They hurt you some way. Maybe they hurt your wife's feelings or whatever. But do you know who they are? Do you know what's going on in their life? Do you know that as a Christian, you're surrounded by sin? That person might have had a horrible day today when they did whatever they did to you. And do you even know that or to stop and think about it? And then what's your reaction when you're wrong? Do, do you want to shoot? I'm going to get even. I'm going to fire back at him with that witty comment, a sarcastic comment to put him down or you know, I'm going to curse back at him. I'm going to flip in the bird in traffic or, you know, whatever it is. Is getting even on your mind to withhold the forgiveness? Man, if you think that way, you are becoming a prisoner. That's exactly what the deceiver wants you to do. Nah. I'm never going to forgive him. I'm never going to forgive her. She screwed me up, man. That dude, that dude hurt me or my family or my feelings in ways that can't be explained. The words that came out of his mouth. You know, that's right. The tongue is the most dangerous weapon we have. The words that come out of our mouth can cut to the core especially when it's coming through pride and self-righteousness. But you know what? The tongue is also the most powerful tool. If you, res- if you respond with goodness, if you respond with a question, if you respond with, man, you must not be having a great day today. How can I help? Can I pray for you somehow? You ever been there? Might not be as deep as my friend Jonathan and what he had to hold on to, but have you ever been there? So what do we do when we know we need to forgive? We know we need to be released. If we don't forgive, we're being held prisoner by that other person. That's it, number one. And the deceiver, Satan, is the one keeping you from it. He doesn't want you forgiving them. Satan didn't want, number one, John, Jonathan, to become a Christian. He was throwing all kind of roadblocks in front of him, but John still got baptized and still professed his faith publicly and started talking about the great news of Jesus Christ. And guess what? The torment just started more and more inside of him of, yeah, but you're a Christian, but what about your past? What about what your dad did to you? What about what you let your dad do to you? Yeah. Yeah, you can't forgive that. It's the way it works, isn't it? Yeah, it's just crazy how he works, especially for those that are growing to know Christ, getting closer and their understanding, the full knowledge of what Christ actually did to us with his crucifixion and resurrection. Satan doesn't want you understanding that, and John was growing in that understanding day by day. Oh, Trey, you know what? Um, I'm going to forgive somebody. You know what? That guy did me wrong. I'm going to forgive him, but I'm never going to forget what they did to me. It amazes me in Christianity how many people say, I believe in Jesus, but, you know, I've been saved, but, you know, I can forgive them, but I'll never forget what they did. Does that line up with what we know about God's word? As David so eloquently writes, 
So far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. We're forgiven as far as the east is from the west. It's an endless cycle. You know, Jesus himself said on the cross as the they were nailing him up and the Pharisees and the Jews that were spitting on him and the Romans that were crushing those nails through his fists, his, his, uh, his palms of his hand. Jesus says, forgive them, Father, for they don't know what they do. What kind of person forgives someone that's persecuting him that way? I think of Stephen where he just gives the speech of a lifetime to all the Pharisees right there. I stood on the spot in Jerusalem where the Pharisees stoned him to death. And Stephen's words were, Lord, do not hold their sins against them. Do not hold this sin against them. Stephen wants to forgive them. Saul of Tarsus was in the audience. He was holding the clothes of the stoners and he went on to become the apostle of apostles in writing two-thirds of the New Testament. I got to think somehow Stephen's asking of forgiveness of them stuck somehow in Saul of Tarsus's mind and planted that seed in him. Yeah, I can forgive, but I can't forget. Well, if you don't try to forget, you're still being held prisoner. Hebrews 8.12, For I'll be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Hebrews 10, 17, I will remember their sins and lawless deeds no more. Jesus' blood, your belief in it, forgave you of every sin, past, present, and future that you will ever commit. Think about it just for a second. You're sitting here and it's 2021. And if you're listening to this driving to work today and you believe in Christ, the day you believe in Christ, you were forgiven. Christ died 2,000 years ago and knew you by name and everything you would do. So every sin you have committed or will ever commit, he has forgiven upon your acceptance of his grace and his belief in his blood and resurrection. It's all you have to do. Every sin you committed was in Jesus' future. And his blood, those sins were laid on his shoulders and his bloody body and his blood dripped for you. I'll close with this. Who's that guy? Who's that girl? Who's that person you haven't forgiven? Christian brother, you have the Holy Spirit of God indwelled in you. Romans 8, 11, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. The same Christ that forgave you of all of your sin. So who is it? Think about it. Think about that person and what's holding you back. The deeper you go, the more you're un- going to understand by you not forgiving them, it that's not who you are. You are a child of God, indwelled with the Holy Spirit. You have the righteousness of God himself. And forgiving people is who we are once we believe. So who is it? Pray over that person today. Pray over that situation today. Pray over that bitterness that's in your heart toward that person today. You're living under the most powerful force ever, and that is God's grace. He forgave you of that sin you committed yesterday. My prayer for you is that you forgive those who have sinned against you And you can shed that, let that go, knock it out of your mind and move forward and be God's light to shine to everyone. The tongue's a powerful weapon. It's used to hurt so many people. But just imagine 
what that tongue can do when you stare at a person and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me. Or you can stare in front of that person who might be just bothered to death by what they did to you and were afraid to approach you. And you look at that person and says, say, Johnny, man, I forgive you for that. I, you know what? That was a crazy time in our lives. And I know you really didn't mean that. I forgive you. Imagine what would happen if we used our tongues for that kind of love and and the power that the Holy Spirit and our words actually do have if we talk in love, unconditional love, if we talk in righteousness, as we forgive those who sinned against us. Brothers, I'm going to be praying for you. I can't wait till next week to come back to you with the next podcast. If you have a question about this one, shoot me an email. Impact Men, it's M-P-A-C-T, men at impactministries.org. Check out our Facebook and Instagram pages for uplifting men's testimonies, revelations. And check out our website, impactministries.org. That's M-P-A-C-T, ministries.org. You know, we are a non-for-profit. We would love for you to help us continue this message of grace through our podcasts, our social media, our events, and our groups as we grow around the world discovering grace one man at a time. Y'all take care. Have a great week. Impact. Men passionate about Christ.